Okay, so everyone knows what today is. This is a big day on the Christian calendar. It's Palm Sunday, and uh, I have um, fond memories of Palm Sunday as a child growing up uh, Catholic. It was always a special day because we got to do something interesting and different at church. Everyone would receive a palm frond when they walked into church that Sunday. Anyone have that background going? You get your palm frond, right? And, and it isn't like we really did anything with them during the church service. Maybe you were at a church someplace where people would wave them in the air or something. We, we never did. I remember us kids, we'd sort of maybe sword fight with them after <laughs> church or try to tickle your brother or whatever in the ear, but uh, we didn't do much with them until we got home. And then it was at least traditional back in my part of the country, the Midwest, it was traditional to, to braid them. Anybody ever braid a palm? It would look something like, something like this. You'd braid them into a shape and you'd use it to uh, decorate the crucifix that was supposed to be hanging on the wall of every good Catholic's home. I, I remember my mom, she was really good at doing this, and she tried to teach me, but I never quite got the hang of it. And, and, and I find it interesting that we still call it Palm Sunday, even though the Gospel of John is the only one of the four Gospels to specifically say that the people were waving palm branches in the air. Each of the four Gospels has the story. They, they call it the, uh, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But John is the only one that mentions palm branches. Matthew and Mark, they call them tree branches, as in like an oak tree or a tree like that. And Luke, no branches at all. In Luke, the people just took off their cloaks and laid them across the road. And I, and I bring that up just as another example of um, how the four Gospels often conflict with each other on the details like that. But the gist of the story is essentially the same in all four of them. Jesus is entering Jerusalem. It's the start of the Passover festival week, and there's this huge demonstration of support for him. He's getting rock star treatment, movie star treatment. It's the ancient equivalent of the, of the red carpet walk before the Oscars, actually. <laughs> a few years ago, I read a, a fascinating book here called The Last Week, and it was co-written by Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan. I highly recommend their works if you want to get a modern take on Bible interpretation. They are, they are excellent. The book is a day-to-day is a -day account of the last week that Jesus spent in Jerusalem, starting with Palm Sunday, and then leading up to his execution, and then uh, the events that took place for two days after that event. And the book tries to answer a very important question. What exactly was Jesus trying to accomplish by coming to Jerusalem during the Passover week? We get a good description of his activities. We get a good description of the events and all the confrontations that he had, but the one thing that we don't get from the gospel stories themselves is, is a picture of the historical context uh, that he was working in. And, and there's really a pretty good and simple reason for why we don't get that kind of information in the gospels, because basically the authors didn't have a clue that folks like us 2,000 years later would still be reading these stories. Their audience, you know, think about it, their audience didn't need a historical context. They were, they were living it. They were right smack dab in the, in the middle of it. And uh, the authors of these Gospels, they never expected the world, as we know it, to still be around 2,000 years later. They were Jewish believers in the apocalypse. They truly thought that this world was going to be ending soon, and then this other world that was ruled by God would be taking its place. The second coming, it was supposed to be over and done with long before now. And that's another one of the faces of Jesus. He was a prophet of this coming apocalypse, this coming grand change where the Roman oppressors and their accomplices in the Jewish religious hierarchy were going to be overthrown, not by the sword, but by the power of God, the power of goodness. What was it that Jesus would say? Things like, the mighty will be brought low, the first will be last, the last will be first. That's the kind of thing he was referring to. And, and yet there were a few people who, who actually expected Jesus to raise an army 
an actual army that would go after the oppressors and run them out of town, defeat the oppressors. So there was this um, a sense of anticipation among some people. When they heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, um, it, was, it, was kind of like, um, it was kind of like they were waiting for the, uh, waiting for the, the new sheriff to come to town, waiting for, the, waiting for the showdown, that kind of a thing. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out the way they expected, because we know the story. By the end of the week, it looked like the villain had won and Jesus had lost. He was arrested. He was executed. His followers went into hiding, and the Romans and their collaborators were still in control of things. I think the people who expected Jesus to be leading some kind of a violent revolution or raise an army really missed the entire point of his ministry. They couldn't have been around when Jesus was preaching this message that's so familiar to us, this message of nonviolent resistance, where he said things like, turn the other cheek, blessed are the peacemakers, and on and on and on. It's pretty hard to miss. It's one of the reasons why many of our contemporary leaders, people like Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., use Jesus as an example of how to accomplish great things by nonviolent means, by nonviolent protest and nonviolent demonstration. And that's exactly what Jesus was up to in Jerusalem that last week. Palm Sunday and the events that followed were part of a carefully orchestrated demonstration. When we read the account from the Gospel of Mark, we begin to see how this works. Jesus tells his followers exactly how they should go about finding a donkey or a colt that he's supposed to be riding into the city. And so here's the story. He says, he says go into that village over there, not just, you know, go find a donkey. He says, go into that village over there, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a colt tied there that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside a house. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, What are you doing untying that colt? And they said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. See, it's all set up in advance. It's all set up. There's a code word. All they have to do is say the code word or the code, code phrase, the Lord needs it and we'll return it soon. They say the code word, like a spy, like a, you know, like a spy movie, right? Say the code word, and, and off they go with what they wanted. But I wonder, why was it so important that he be riding on a donkey or a colt? Why do you think it was so important that it be a donkey or a colt? <laughs> okay, yeah, they're cute. That's the donkey from Shrek. Yes, he is cute. Everybody knows what his favorite food was, right? Waffles. But anyway, yes, donkeys are cute. But that's not the reason why it had to be a donkey or a colt. For that, to find the reason for that, we have to go way back to the prophet Zechariah in the Hebrew Scriptures. This passage here tells the story. Rejoice greatly, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, even on a donkey's colt. I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem, and I will destroy all the weapons used in battle. Your king will bring peace to the nations. So, he's invoking the imagery of Zechariah. People would have been familiar with this. And Jesus is giving a little hint here. He's giving a hint to the people that uh, are expecting violence. He's telling them that no weapons will be involved in the coming transformation. He's going to bring peace to the nations, not with weapons, but with ideas. Nonviolent resistance to the great domination system of Rome and its collaborators who were among his own people. Borg and Crossan have a fascinating theory in their book, The Last Week. They think that one of the reasons why Jesus picked this particular week to go to Jerusalem 
was because it was the time of the big Passover festival. There would be, I don't know, thousands of people from all over Palestine, a great big audience for what was supposed to happen next. And because it was such a big festival, because it was such a big deal, there would be another very important person in the city, Pontius Pilate. He was the Roman governor of Palestine, and the custom in those days was for Pilate to set up residence in Jerusalem when there was a major festival such as this. He would be there to be a figurehead, to represent the power of Rome, uh, to keep the peace. And again, to serve as a reminder to the Jewish people that uh, the only reason they got to have their festivals was because the Romans, in their great generosity, decided that they would tolerate the festival and allow it to happen. That's how things work with a domination system like Rome. The Roman military would never go anywhere without some kind of a procession, and the higher the rank of the leader, the bigger the procession. So it was a pretty good bet that at some time on the day that we call Palm Sunday, there would have been a Roman military procession coming into the city through another gate. They were bringing Pilate to his residence in the city. Would have been on a Saturday because that was the Jewish Sabbath. Nobody would have been out and about to be impressed by this demonstration of Roman dominance and power. No, the first day of the week, Sunday, would have been the perfect time for the Romans to have their procession. This procession that would demonstrate the worldly powers of domination and violence and oppression. So, imagine how it all might have looked. At one end of the city, here's Jesus, riding on a small donkey, or call it a colt, instead of a big war horse. There's no armor, no flags, no weapons. He's invoking this prophetic image of peace and nonviolence. Might have looked like this, a peaceful scene, happy people. But at the other end of the city, well, that's something completely different. Maybe something like this. Chariots, war horses, armor, shields, lances, maybe a, maybe a drumbeat going on. Unlike... The other procession, nobody would have been particularly happy to see this one. The Romans, they'd been in power for about 90 years by this time, so there was an entire generation who had come of age with the message being drummed into their heads that it was their purpose in life to serve divine Caesar, to serve Rome. Their purpose in life was to simply accept this, this domination system and be a part of it. And if you dared to speak out or cause trouble, well, you could be flogged or more likely crucified. So these, uh, these two scenes, they, they, they couldn't be possibly more different. The contrast is just stunning. The procession of the domination system sends the message that you're insignificant, you're worthless, you will be assimilated, resistance is futile. <laughs> All that matters is power and obedience. The other procession sends a different message, one that says you're worthy and you're far more powerful than you dared to think. After he had delivered basically that same message all throughout the rural areas and the provinces and the countryside of Palestine in those days, Jesus is coming to the very center of power in that region, and he's going to show the people what the next step is going to be. So his entry into Jerusalem is meant to get attention. It's about getting the attention of the dominant powers and then engaging them in a way that they weren't ready for yet. Jesus was going to show people how to do that, how to use the power of a divine idea, of uh, non-resistance, of non-violence, instead of a sword, and he was going to demonstrate personally the kind of courage that it would take to do that. Jesus represents the essential divinity or the essential human dignity of all people. We call it the Christ. The Christ will always offer alternative ways of being in the world. Sometimes those alternatives 
run contrary to what the powerful, what the domination system wants us to do. The Christ is here to tell us that there's always another procession, which means another way of looking at the world, another way of being in the world, and we get to choose which one we're going to be a part of. Two processions, we get to choose. The kind of nonviolent resistance that Jesus is about to demonstrate is going to bring a violent response. His nonviolence is going to bring a violent response. He knows that. Violence is the only way that Rome knew how to respond. So, part of the demonstration is to expose the violence of Rome and the corruption of his own leaders, his own people who were collaborating. He was going to expose that for all to see. Think about Gandhi. It wasn't until the British cracked down violently and the rest of the world saw it and was appalled that things began to change, that people were mobilized in ways that um, couldn't have been accomplished any other way. So Palm Sunday is setting the stage. He makes his entry, he invokes the image of peace and nonviolence, and right after the procession, he starts planning his next move. Remember, these are plain demonstrations. Here's from the Gospel of Mark. It says, Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He's casing the joint. <laughs> He's scoping out the scene of his next demonstration. And as it says, it was already late. It was too late in the afternoon. Not enough people around. Best to wait until the next morning when the place would be full of people, teeming with people who had come for the big Passover festival. That's when he would have his big audience for what was going to happen next. More on that next week. <laughs> See you then.